Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and we love helping the well-dressed take care of their wardrobes. In part two of our interview with uh, Justin Fitzpatrick, he shares with us the history or the genesis of Jay Fitzpatrick footwear and where he's headed. I guess uh, it all started because I wanted to have my own company first and foremost. I'm not a very good employee, nor do I take uh, authority too well. So I knew that I wanted to have my own thing, and my dad always taught me that if you do what you love, you're successful. So I knew that I wanted to have my own thing and something I really enjoyed. I loved shoes from a kid, but of course back then it was Nikes and, and Reebok and Adidas and all of that stuff. But as I was in university, I was working at Nordstrom. I was majoring in entrepreneurship so I could learn how to start my own company. And I just noticed a, a lack of what I felt was good product being offered to the American man. And I was reading all these magazines that showed European product and saw how amazing it was, but then never saw it in the US. Of course, you got your Santoni and your Ferragamo, but these in, in reality are, are only a fraction of what is really out there. I knew there was this reputation for American men not dressing so well to the European eye and standard, but then I saw that it can never change if the department stores only buy the same things yeah. and if they're only buying the stuff that doesn't look that amazing, they're playing it safe as opposed to being a bit daring and giving better options. And I said, this is never going to change unless somebody does something about it. And so I said, I'm going to start a shoe line that's better looking than anything Norsham or any other shoe store in America has had to offer and come back and supply the American man with great footwear that's not overly expensive, honest price, looks good, feels good, and can help the American man dress better. I needed to, I needed to know my stuff for anybody to, to want to buy my shoes. You know, I'm good. There's new young American kid on the block. If anybody's going to say, well, yeah, I'm going to spend 300 pounds on that shoe, they're going to have to trust that it's a good product and that the person behind it stands for something. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I wanted to learn everything I could about shoes to become an expert. Um, and I told myself after two years at Nordstrom, I wanted to move to Europe and learn how to make shoes by hand from one of the top five shoemakers in the world, or at least in Europe. After university, I stayed working at Nordstrom and, and it's crazy how everything kind of went together. Uh, I was reading this magazine, and I don't think it exists anymore, but it was probably the, the best uh, menswear magazine that I'd ever, I'd ever come across, because it was like zero ads and just full of amazing content. I remember reading this article about this guy in Florence called Stefano Bemmer, never heard of him, and uh, Shoes just looked amazing. I looked at the pictures of Florence. I was like, this place is beautiful. I could live in this place. I could work with this guy. That'd be great. And then a few weeks later, there was this guy who was, I don't know, I don't know how to put the word. He wasn't interning. And uh, so he was just on the floor, kind of just shadowing everybody. I presume he was learning the business. Yeah. And so we got to talking. He was Italian. He was from Florence. And I was just like, oh, you know, I read this article about this guy and he's amazing and these are my goals and this is what I want to do and he just kind of chuckled and he was like oh it's funny because my dad's really good friends with him and I was just like Phew. imagine that so I said hey can your dad get me an interview and sit down because I'd love to go work with him he's like I don't see why not as soon as I go back to Italy I'll talk to my dad but I think it should be fine and uh, he kept his word he contacted me he said Stefano said come whenever you want and uh, five months later, I was in Italy um, begging for an apprenticeship. He said, okay, I'll take you on. And it was kind of like, okay, I'll take this kid on, I'll teach him, but I'll also see if he can help me grow my business in America. And I was like, okay, whatever, I'll try to do whatever I can. And so that was that. He said, come whenever you want. I had to save up some money. So six months later, I just packed up my life and flew to Italy. That's crazy. So and you actually, I mean, did you end up apprenticing and learning how to make shoes or? Yeah, yeah, no, I did the whole shebang, like a real tough apprenticeship. Um, and the first part of that apprenticeship was actually spending time with Stefano's brother, Mario, learning how to shine shoes. So okay. that's where I learned how to shine shoes. From and Mario Bremer himself. Yeah, in the first two weeks of the apprenticeship, and I was thinking, what is, this is not shoemaking. <laughs> <laughs> I was so spoiled. I was like, I just want to get right into it. But I actually learned a lot about presentation and packaging and small little details you don't think about, but that set apart your brand from others when a customer receives his goods. Yeah. And uh, 
That was the first part of my training, and then step by step, I went through the shoemaking process. That's I, great. So, so you were there in Italy. You know, you were learning, you know, the trade from them. But you know, you knew that you didn't want to be just a bespoke shoemaker. You didn't want to just be, you know, making bespoke shoes. You had greater ambitions than that. So, you know, where did you go after that? I mean, what was the next? stop on this journey. Then I knew things weren't going to go forward with Stefano and I, so I, me and my girlfriend made a plan. She moved to Brighton, south of London, and we said, okay, let's, let's, we, we want to be together, let's get married, but obviously we have to wait a little while. And so she said, do you want to, do you think you'd want to live in England? I said, yeah, why not? London is a, is a shoe mecca. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, Prior to having gone to Bemer, I had contacted Gaziano Gerlin about apprenticeship, but they had just launched. They said, I'm sorry, we don't have any money or time to be thinking about apprentices, but keep in touch. So this came back into my mind when she said, do you want to move to England? I said, oh, Gaziano Gerlin, let me go down that route. I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So she moved to Brighton. I would go back to America, make money, go see her. I, moved, I went to Brighton. And I reached out to G and G, and now I had, you know, I had some experience under my belt. And and I contacted them, and Tony was like, "Yeah, no problem. Come up whenever you're here. We'll take a look at uh, what you've done, and we'll talk about potential stuff." I was like, "Sweet." And so I got to Brighton for a holiday, just for a holiday. We hadn't like married yet; I hadn't moved there. And I went to visit them, and uh, I thought, okay, if I could continue learning from these guys, it'd be, it'd be great. This could be like my final bit before I, I feel like I could be ready. And I took my, my quintessential black and red Stefano shoe with me, my pride and joy, and I, and I went up and I met Tony and Dean. And I showed them and you know they were really nice, they were receptive, but they were like, hey, it's great. They said, if we're gonna be frank, you need more practice before you could make a G and G end product. But um, they said, we can't really take you on and pay you because we just hired Daniel Wiegand like a month before or two wow. months before. Yeah. But they said, if you want to come to the factory anytime you want, we'll give you all the materials you want and we'll do what we can to just help you. Yeah, that's incredibly generous. And so I was like, okay, this is awesome, but it's not realistic. I need to make money. I don't have, you know, moving at that time from the US to England, I lost 50% of my money. And this is when I decided to start the shoe the shoe snob blog. Okay. Because I, I, I hate the idea of not feeling like I'm going forward. I feel like I'm going backwards if I'm not going forwards. I knew I needed to keep doing something that kept me relevant and kept my knowledge going. And so there were no real, you know, publications about shoes in this time. The magazines always talked about men's clothes. And if they were shoes, it was rubbish shoes I and mean, whoever was paying them the most in advertising. And I said, you know, there's so many nice shoes out there. I'm sure there's people interested in learning about these nice shoes. So I just said, you know what? I'm crazy enough to start this blog and, and just go at it. And I, and I wanted to make it as big as like the Sartorialist. And I was like, I want to be the biggest shoe blog in the world. And I want everybody to know the shoe snob and to trust the shoe snob so that I can help educate people. So that when I have my shoe brand, I have customers already lined up. Mm -hmm. So I did it and um, of course in the beginning it was a bit rough, you know, I was writing about maybe things I would never dream of writing about now and I was a bit provocative because, um, you know, my dad, my dad, I remember actually I got the shoe snob name from my dad and my dad was, you know, my, my, my business role model. He was a crazy successful entrepreneur through highs and lows but uh, he was a smart guy. And I said, Dad, I'm, I want to start this blog, but I don't know what to call it. And I'm, I'm thinking the shoe aficionado. And he was like, Just, that's so boring. Who wants to read the shoe aficionado? You have to be the shoe snob, and you have to invoke a reaction out of people. You have to touch their emotions. I said, look at Howard Stern. The people that hate him go back to read him more than the people that love him. And he says, you, you gotta be like that. Even if you don't want to, you, you gotta give people a reason to want to come back and see what you have to say. Mm -hmm. I said, well, he makes sense, so let me try that. And it works. But now I'm in a new country, and I need money in reality, because yeah, I, I have to pay rent and bills. You know? yourself. 
So the G&G &G thing, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna still use that, that offer. You know, whenever I have a weekend, I'm gonna go up to Ketter and I'm gonna knock out a pair of shoes in a weekend. I'm gonna bother Tony with as many questions as he'll allow me to ask and just kind of absorb whatever he can give me as far as knowledge goes. But um, I said, okay, this, you know, for me, I think everything happens for a reason. So I was like, this must be my way forward. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll entertain this I'll, and I'll make, it what, I'll make a name for myself. I'll get known in London and I'll launch my shoe line at Gives and Hawks. And so I said, that was my goal. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So I met with CEO. <laughs> It was the best interview he did. He didn't even need for me to do anything. He just kind of hired me on the spot based <laughs> off their recommendation, okay. which was great. So on the train journeys, this is where I, uh, I started knocking out my designs, my collection. Okay. Uh, I'm by no means an artist, but uh, the first shoes I drew were appalling looking. But, you know, I just said, okay. I knew that, because Tony had taught me, pattern making in reality, uh, I'm not going to say it's simple, I'm never going to dare say that, but to get your idea across to a good pattern maker can be simple if that pattern maker is very good. You pay for the idea made in Italy or made in uh, England. Um, it's not just quality you're paying for, you're paying for a name, a thought. Um, and I, and I realized that, and the, and the thing about maybe a factory not allowing me to do something was crucial because I have all these ideas of yeah. doing things very it's different. Part of the ethos of your brand was doing things that no one had really ever done before. Exactly. The shoe snob's growing and all throughout this, so my name's getting more known, and I end up, uh, I'm talking to a guy who owns his own shoe brand. I don't know if he'll want me to share it, so I won't say it. And and we want to meet. And he's like, if you want to find a factory, I'm happy to introduce you to mine. I knew his shoes, they were of, of good caliber. I said, well, that cuts out a trip there that you know I don't have to do, and boom, I can just go straight away to a factory. And is that with the same factory that you still use to this day? Yeah, same factory. That's incredible. So, and at that same time, you're still watching, or you're still working at Gives. Still working doing at Gives. The, the kind of the shoe snob and the shoe shine service. And I think that's where we first met, was on one of my first trips to London. Of course, I went into Gives and Hawk, and I think Simon Crompton had introduced me to, you know, the CEO. So he was kind of giving me a tour, and he introduced us. And around that same time, you know, it was whenever you launched your first few models, and Gives actually allowed you to sell your shoes within their store. Yeah. Right. So I talked to the CEO that put me on. I said, hey, look, I'm going to start this shoe brand. Um, I know you guys have your own shoes, but it'd be really amazing if you could help me out here with maybe like a year or whatever of your time, just so I can launch my brand. And this guy was all about like helping small artisans out. And he was like, no problem, Justin. Sure, no, no, no worries. I'm happy to help you out. We'll make it work, yada, yada, yada. I was like, great. I placed my shoe order for like 40,000 euros worth of shoes. Wow. A month later. That's a lot of shoes. <laughs> yeah. It was like uh, 400 pairs or 300 some pairs, I can't remember. Um, it was a lot for a first collection. I wanted to make it big. A lot of people thought I was crazy. I had like 29 SKUs, but I knew that I needed to make an entrance uh, and I needed depth of models to show my design capabilities, not less models and more sizes. And a month later, this guy resigns. I remember that, yeah. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> because when new power comes in, it's like a flushing of the old, yeah. what the old guy did. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just like, this can't be happening. And so I remember this so vividly. The new CEO's doing his tour, kind of like the tour you got with this guy. He's doing his tour at the store manager. And he comes to my desk and the store manager introduces me to him and says, oh, this is Justin, he's our shoe shiner, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he also has a, a shoe brand about to launch and that uh, we were going to sell at Gives. First thing the guy asked me, oh, okay, that's great. Are the shoes going to have Gives and Hawk's name inside? I said, no. And he said, well, if they don't have the brand inside, we're not selling them. <laughs> and I was just like, but there was no way 
and there was no way in history I was gonna launch my line with somebody else's name in it. Yeah. I refuse, I'd rather go under. But I can see that he's a businessman, first and foremost. And if you talk to businessmen in ways that make financial sense, they're gonna listen. So I said, okay, let me, shoes are still being made. That's all going. I've like two or three months to settle this. Okay. And so like a month later, all through the grapevine, I see they have like a collection of shoes, but it's like four black shoes and one tan shoe, and that's it, five shoes. It's embarrassing, it's not a collection, it's just like a dribble of shoes. <laughs> and so when the power shifted, whoever was ahead in charge of ordering shoes dropped the ball. So I go back to this guy and I say, I know you already told me no, but allow me to say this again. You have five shoes, which is not a, not something you can really offer to a customer. You're not giving them much choice. I have a collection of shoes and I have a readership of X. I would like just to have a year of Gibbs and Hawks time to which I will pay for all the shoes. It costs you nothing. You take a commission and I bring customers into your shop that could potentially buy suits. Sounds like a I fair said, deal. Yeah, I said, you have nothing to lose. I take all the risk. All I need is, is storage and shelving space. And he said, let me think about it. And I knew he was gonna say yes. So he emails me the next day. Okay, Justin, I'll give you one year time. I was like, thank God. <laughs> because uh, 40,000 shoes with nowhere to sell them, 40,000 euros, euros yeah. worth of shoes with nowhere to sell them would have been a bad start. And um, so yeah, I launched at Gives and it was a tremendous success. It was an amazing place to launch. And so you're selling at Gives, and then, you know, kind of fast forward, you've since left, you know, you're living in London, you know, you've got, you know, a pretty well-developed kind of UK operation, you know, really shipping worldwide, you know, off of jfitzpatrickfootwear.com or .co.uk. And then, you know, now you're in New York and you've kind of jumped back to where you began, yeah. which is here in America. So talk to us a little bit about that, because that was a big, I mean, that's also, you know, you kind of were walking the plank, if you will. And, uh, you know, you're back in America, and I'm sure that's kind of significant and meaningful for you, right? Yeah, I mean, the goal was always to see men dressing better in America by bringing my shoes to America. So I had to do this hiatus adventure in Europe in order to learn everything that I could to come back and, and finally be able to supply the country that I'm from in love with good shoes. And so this probably happened a little bit sooner than had planned, but it was always my dream to move to New York, which is my favorite city and you know, kind of the mecca for retail and finance and all those things. I mean, a brand in theory should probably launch in New York if the, it's the most opportunistic city uh, to be successful uh, because also it has close ties to Europe as far as distance and planes. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a showroom in New York, right? So people can come visit you. Yeah. Uh, and then you're working with Not Standard, you know, which is a, a custom suiting company that has quite a bit of locations around the United States and you're doing trunk shows. Yeah, tours with them. So yeah, we're set up in the West Village, um, building that to have basically a dedicated North American company. And then my UK business will supply the rest of the world and it'll be separate. Okay. Um, so America will have a dedicated website, stock, pricing system, everything. This is still in the works, but should happen by third quarter, hopefully, latest fourth quarter um, of 18. And yeah, and the hopes to, to grow that and to kind of get out there and let people see the shoes, feel the shoes, is to do a U.S. tour of trunk shows. And then Not Standard was kind enough to open their doors to me. Um, and allow me to come to their shops and present the shoes, meet their clients, meet my clients in the respective markets. And yeah, we started in Texas because believe it or not, Texas is probably my second, uh, second or third largest state in the U.S. for, After, like, for like sales. New York and California. Yeah, New York definitely number one. I don't know if California and Texas, I don't know who's bigger, I haven't checked that. But neck and neck. Neck and right neck, there. yeah. yeah. Um, because there were three shops here, it was it was enticing to make this the first one and kind of knock them all out in one go. You did Austin, Houston, and now Dallas. Yeah, Houston, Austin, and Dallas. Houston, Austin, but Dallas, yeah, yeah, no, and it's been it's been well received. It's been good, and uh, 
might make it uh, a regular biannual thing to do that. And then we're also talking about potentially leaving trial fitting shoes in the showrooms with a string of samples so that people have access to at least come try the shoes and check them out mm -hmm. before they make an online purchase. Yeah. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up and please subscribe to our channel and turn on your notifications by clicking the bell to the right of the subscribe button so that you can learn whenever we release new videos. If you have any questions or comments about anything we discussed on this video, please ask them in the comments section below. And of course, please visit hangerproject.com where we have the largest, most comprehensive collection of luxury garment care and shoe care accessories in the world, as well as many other incredible products for the well-dressed. And while you are there, subscribe to our newsletter to receive notifications of new product launches, promotions, as well as a weekly digest of all the videos we publish here on our YouTube channel.